Hello class, so we're moving on to inflammation. Um, but before we jump into inflammation, let's talk about the body's defenses. Um, there are three lines of defense for our body. The first line is the uh, unbroken skin and mucous membranes, along with the tears and gastric juices. These are a physical mechanical barrier, and they just keep things out of the body. Um, and so there, and they also include the tears and gastric juices, like I said. Um, so they're non-specific. That's our first line of defense to keep things out of the body. Our second line of defense is also uh, non-specific, meaning that it, it keeps every. It try, it, it's it's not specific to a specific organism or uh, or type of damage, and it includes two things. It includes phagocytosis, primarily from the neutrophils and monocytes, and then also the uh, inflammation response, which is into all types of different types of cell damage. And then finally, a third line of defense. This is a specific defense, and this is uh, what we also, uh, that this is the part that actually produces specific antibodies to, or cell-mediated immunity to uh, fight off specific uh, pathogens. So, like, we get immune to chickenpox after we have got it. Or we use the chickenpox vaccine to produce these specific uh, bodies. So the third line of defense is the only one that's specific, and it's the only one that provides long-term immunity. Um, here's an image, and it kind of summarizes our different types of defenses. And we can see the first line of defense, which is the skin and mucous membrane, along with the... Uh, Tears, saliva, and, and fluid, that's our non-specific um, defenses. And then our second line of defense, which is phagocytosis and inflammatory response and inf interferon. Those are our second line of defense. And then our third line of defense are the specific defenses, which are the immune response due to antibodies and the cell-mediated response. So... That's our third line of defense, and it's specific. If all these defenses are overcome, and that's when we actually experience um, injury or disease, when all those different defenses are overcome. So normal capillary exchange is very important when we're talking about, we need to understand it before we talk about inflammation. Um, so, for example, um, our capillaries are normally not um, all open at one time. Um, it just depends on how much the metabolic needs are. So if we're exercising, we'll have more blood flow, we'll have more going to our muscles. Um, if it's cold outside, we're going to have less going to our skin. Those types of things. Um, the movement from the capillary to the interstitial fluid is uh, dependent on the hydrostatic pressure and the osmotic pressure. So we've pushed things out, the fluid, the electrolytes, oxygen, nutrients out on that hydrostatic pressure, the net hydrostatic pressure. And then we reabsorb it back into the capillary on the venous end um, due to the osmotic pressure, which is the pressure that pulls it back into the capillary. And it, and it gets, helps get the waste into the capillary. Um, so we can see here, this is a diagram of normal capillary exchange versus inflammatory response. So here we see our capillary bed. The blood is flowing through the capillary bed, and it's going to, um, the fluid's going to be exchanged. So it goes, in, it goes out the arterial side, and then it goes back in the venule side. So the cells actually remain in the blood. The fluid and the, prote and the proteins have, the fluid can move, but the proteins stay inside the blood. Okay. Over here for the injury, what we see is that there are uh, chemical mediators, which are chemicals that are released by the damaged cells, and they cause several things to happen. One of the things that happen is vasodilation. So the, the blood vessel is larger than normal. The diameter increases. Um, you also see that it's uh, the capillary permeability increases, which means more stuff can flow out of the capillary. Um, and then the, another thing that can happen is the leukocytes will move towards and will go out of the capillary and go in towards the tissue, towards the cell, the cellular damage. And then finally we can see that there is also some um, phagocytosis of the damaged debris um, so that it can heal. 
So inflammation is a protective mechanism and is one of the most basic concepts in um, pathophysiology. The disorders of inflammation always end in itis. Um, that means it's inflammation. Um, and it's just a normal defense mechanism, and we see it with all kinds of uh, disease processes. Um, the signs and symptoms usually serve as a warning for an underlying problem, and the problem may even be hidden within the body, but we can see the signs and symptoms of inflammation. It is not the same as infection. Infection has to have a, a pathogenic organism, um, but infection can cause inflammation. So there's lots of things that cause inflammation. Some examples that cause inflammation are uh, physical damage, so just like a cut or a sprain, it's actually that physical damage. Caustic materials, acids and bases. Um, ischemia, low oxygen levels, or infarction, which is cell death due to all low oxygen levels, can cause inflammation. Allergic reactions, extreme heat or cold, uh, foreign bodies such as uh, splinter or glass, infection of microorganisms. Um, all those different things can cause infl inflammation. Um, but they all follow a very similar pathway to cause inflammation. Um, typically, there's going to be some kind of damage to the capillaries and the tissue cells. So there has to be damage. And all these, all these different causes cause damage to the cells. The cells then release uh, a chemical... Uh, called bradykinin, um, and it's released, and that bradykinin will stimulate the pain receptors to release histamine. So the histamine and bradykinin work together, and they will cause the capillary dilation. Um, this increases the blood flow to that area, um, and it will cause inflammation to take occur. Um, if there was a break in the skin, and a bacteria got into that tissue, then the inflammation would draw the neutrophils to phagocytize the bacteria and then also draw the macrophages to go in that area and get rid of the, um, leave the bloodstream and phagocytize the microbes. Um, the process of inflammation is basically the same. It's always the bradykinin to the pain receptors and then the pain, the pain, the pain causes Histamines, okay. So bradykinin histamines causes vasodilation and the capillary permeability. So the timing will vary according to what kind of the specific cause. Some is a little faster, some is a little slower, um, but it all is mediated by chemicals that affect the blood vessels and nerves um, in the area. So what we see is what we're going to see with the vasodilation. Um, is going to cause increased blood flow, hyperemia, and then it's also going to increase the capillary permeability, and the chemicals are going to attract the um, cells of the immune system to that area, the neutrophils and macrophages. Um, the local effects of inflammation are always the same, um, redness, heat, swelling, pain. Um, the redness um, and warmth comes from increased blood flow, the swelling is because the fluid is shifting out of the capillary into the interstitial space, and that causes edema. Then we have pain because of the increased pressure, and along with the bradykinins. Um, and then lastly, um, we can also see some loss in function because um, it can occur if the inflammation is pronounced and very significant because there's less uh, movement of the fluid in that area and it can, the edema can cause it to have a lack of nutrients. Here's an image of a patient with inflammation. You can see the redness, and it would have heat, and it would be a little painful. Okay, warmth. Um, along with egg, uh, inflammation, sometimes there's an exudate, which is a fluid. Um, there's a few different types. Um, serious exudate is a watery fluid consisting of primarily, uh, mostly fluid with some protein and white blood cells. Then we have fibrinous exudate, which is a more of a, a sticky, thick um, exudate with a high cell and high fibrin content. So lots of cells, a lot of fibrin in that exudate. Um, then lastly, we have purulent exudate, 
and this is where it is more thick and yellow green um, pus pussy is you kind of want to think about that and it contains leukocytes cetabris and often um, microorganisms and those microorganisms are gonna um, leukocytes and microorganisms and cetabris those are all local effects of inflammation, which means in one area. Systemic means the whole body. So some, some systemic effects of inflammation include um, mild fever, pyrexia, mild fever, um, when the inflammation is throughout the body because of the release of pyrogens. And pyrogens um, cause fever. Malaise, which is the feeling of well, fatigue, headache, and anorexia, or um, a loss of appetite. Um, so just looking at inflammation in general, let's look at fever. So typically there is some kind of some kind of damage or that or that causes the release of pyrogens. Okay? Those pyrogens are released and they reset the hypothalamic control system. So instead of at ninety eight point six degrees or thirty degrees thirty seven degrees Celsius, we move to a higher temperature maybe a hundred that's our our set point at this point um, and so our hypothalamus can moves it up because of the pyrogens then our body will start shivering which increases the temperature it makes us feel cold so we ball up in a ball um, and we try to conserve our heat so we increase our metallic metabolic rate we increase our heart rate um, we curl up we also vasoconstrict so that that fever that's how we're going to increase our temperature. Us feeling cold is going to make us want to curl up in, in a ball, cover up, and then it's going to increase our temperature. Okay, our body reaches the new temperature, and then we treat the underlying cause. Maybe give some Tylenol. It removes the pyrogens or uh, resets it, and resets us back to normal. And then our body can uh, re quit sweating, and we we start sweating. We vasodilate. Um, and then we extend the body and our temperature returns back to normal. So the pyrogens cause it to go high and that we remove the pyrogens and it goes back to normal. Um, the course of inflammation and healing, if we look, this is just an example of the process. So we see there's some kind of injury which causes acute inflammation. Acute means short and severe, usually short and severe. It releases the chemical mediators particularly the bradykinins and the histamines, maybe some prostaglandins, and then that causes vasodilation and blood increase, blood flow, increased permeability, chemotaxis, and irritation of nerve endings, the pain. Um, we'll wall off and we'll create a clot around the area if there's damaged that way. Phagocytosis occurs and removes the debris, and it gets it ready for healing. And then healing, if the problem persists, the cause persists, we end up with chronic inflammation, eventually scar tissue. But we can also, um, if the cause stops, we can get healing, which it can occur as regeneration or resolution. And we'll talk more about each one of those in a few. Okay. I'll stop right now.